Good morning and welcome back to uh, Coffee with Sister Jacinta and with us doing a spiritual journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And um, so far we're just two days into it. We have actually covered 30 paragraphs, so that was quite good. And um, we were looking really at a prologue as to what was the intent of this catechism. And the one thing that we mentioned was that it isn't written to be um, just a question and answer catechism, which many of us are used to. And it even encourages us, okay, to write catechisms um, based on this catechism and, um, or to go back to catechisms that already exist, okay? So um, the one that was written for the entire universal church was one called the Roman uh, Catechism or the, the, the um, Catechism of Trent. So, um, you know, the faith doesn't change. If it changed, okay, then it wouldn't be Catholic. That's because the Catholic faith says that the truths of the Catholic Church were taught by Christ, okay, and we're completely, as far as revelation is concerned, ended with the last apostles dying, okay, because the Lord had told us that for some things they wouldn't understand, and until the gift of the Holy Spirit was there, and so that's the end of revelation, okay, um, but we always have a development, a better understanding of our faith, and, um, and a different presentation of our faith. And sometimes we have challenges because of the new inventions, like we mentioned, okay? And then seeing where the, how to meet that um, within the Catholic Church, or new discoveries. Um, one of the famous discoveries, and we'll probably bring this up again in class, okay, was um, about the fact that the sun didn't go around us, that we read around the sun. And at first, the church didn't know what to think of that. Was that um, contrary to the faith? And, and so they asked those who were in the world of science, okay, to hold off on, on making any declaration until they could really see if that was contradictory. Uh, unfortunately, Galileo, they said he was a very proud man and, um, and arrogant, and he wasn't willing to wait. And so the church actually um, censored him, okay, and, um, and they lifted that many years later, actually, <laughs> okay, but, um, you know, and it wasn't even the church saying that it wasn't true. It was just like knowing that God became a man and looking at the world as we had up to that point understood it, okay, it seemed like, well, God made man, okay, you know, and he became a human being and everything went around, okay, the earth. Um, but we were fine with the fact that, you know, it wasn't anything contradictory. And actually, it's so beautiful to know it goes around the sun, okay, and Christ is the light of the world, okay. Um, and, and the church was very open to that. And actually, the ones who were mainly doing these discoveries were priests. Um, they were the ones who had, um, you know, made many of the inventions that many of us, um, take for granted, you know, just hearing um, like Copernicus, you know, often we don't even know that he was actually a priest, um, you know, and d the person who came up with even the Big Bang Theory, you know, we never learned about that he was actually a priest also. And these are things that we have. So the Catholic Church has always been very, very strongly um, into the world of science because God created the world and we're discovering it. Um, so the catechism um, is written, okay, to be able to enfold all of this knowledge, okay, that's been passed on to us. Again, from um, the time of actually the writing of the scripture, referring to that, okay, so, and then the time of Christ and these 2,000 years, looking at sermons, looking at the lives of saints, um, looking at different documents of the church, and then trying to um, encompass all of them in the teaching. So, we were able to get through the prologue, and then we began looking at man's quest for God. Uh, this section is called, I Believe, We Believe, and then we're looking at man's capacity for God. And, you know, there's many people who talk about the God hole that's in them. And you know, it's just this idea that we're looking, we always know there's, that there's an incompleteness, no matter how perfect a day is, no matter how perfect a friendship is. Um, there's this... God hole. There's, there's something made for infinite, and, and we all fall short, whether it be persons or things, um, possessions, power, that doesn't fulfill this, this urge in us, and, and the only one that can is God, and, and when we don't know that, it can be extremely frustrating. 
And that's why it's so important for us, um, the faithful, to be able to share our faith with other people and help them to know where they can find that fulfillment. So we're going to start now with paragraph 31. It says, ways of coming to know God. Created in God's image and called to know and love him, the person who seeks God discovers certain ways of coming to know him. These are also called proofs for the existence of God, not in the sense of proofs in the natural sciences, but rather in the sense of converging and convincing arguments, which allow us to attain certainty about the truth. These ways of approaching God from creation have a twofold point of departure, the physical world and the human person, the world. Paragraph 32, starting from movement, becoming, contingency, the world's order and beauty, one can come to a knowledge of God as the origin and the end of the universe. Those were five different proofs that they were pointing to, okay? These were actually given to us through Thomas Aquinas. He was a philosopher and a theologian, amazing person in the, in the history of the church. Um, when you actually look at different intelligences and IQs, they, they give St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Uh, <laughs> um, Albert Einstein, um, all the same kind of IQ. Um, they were just phenomenal in their abilities and their knowledge. And um, so he was thinking, okay, how is, you know, like, faith is never contrary to logic or reason. And so he was able to look at the world and say, okay, by reason alone, you would have to say God exists because there's movement. And if I have this book, okay, and it's just sitting on a desk, all right, um, it's going to sit on that desk and it's not going to do anything. Unless, okay, if I find it on the other side of the table, something had to move it, okay? It can't move of itself. But we see a whole universe moving. So there had to be something that started that movement that wasn't dependent on anyone else to move it. And that is one way that logically we can come that there has to be a God because there is movement and there's no way for something to move without something moving it. And obviously that thing can't have a dependency on being moved. And that's what we can call God. Okay. Um, and this would be a way of knowing it by reason, not by revelation, because by revelation, we get to know God as a person or three persons. Okay. And that becomes a relationship, but we could know that of um, just using your own common sense, using your reasoning abilities, you have to come to a knowledge of God. Um, another way that sometimes, uh, okay, Thomas Aquinas again, he mentioned one called um, contingency. Okay, and this would be like, um, uh, if, if I exist, then I must have parents. And if my parents exist, they must have parents. And if they exist, they must have parents. Okay, well, at one point, okay, there has to be, okay, a, a, someone who actually could begin all life. Again, because otherwise it just goes on and on and on and on backwards, and we know we're not infinite beings. Um, so, what brought about, okay, that existence, okay, that uh, ability for something to be passed on, to pass on, pass on. Okay, again, it's another approach of coming to the knowledge of God. One that I really like, okay, was the one he mentioned about the world's order. Okay, um, and that one, um, I remember Father Harden was a teacher for us a number of times. That was an amazing grace for us as a community. And um, his way of describing order, okay, was if you took a, I mean, you could take any dictionary, but he just, for, for the fun of it, he said, so take an unabridged dictionary and um, cut every word out, okay? And then take that entire pile of words now, throw them up into the air, and how many times do you have to do that before they all fall down in order? Okay, and, and in place, and you would do it. it's impossible. Okay, and and yet, when you think about it, I mean, there's 
I don't know, maybe there's a billion words. I don't know how many words there actually are, okay, in the English language. We have fewer than most languages. But, um, but it, let's just say we would have two billion or three billion words. The human body is made up of trillions of cells. Okay, for them to be in order, okay, think about the fact that, you know, my hand can move as fast as I'm thinking. Even, I don't even know what I'm thinking. And my, my hand sort of matches what I'm doing. Um, you know, and, and yet it's coming from the brain, being able to tell my hand what to do. Um, think about how fast you could grab something when it's falling. Um, think about a blade of grass, okay? How do the roots, okay, and, and the blade of grass, okay, the photosynthesis and, and the water be able to communicate and know where to go? Okay, um, and, and we have this order, okay? It's absolutely beautiful, it's fascinating, especially as you begin to look at science. Um, so there has to be something that put it there because it's totally illogical for me to throw up all these words and have them fall in order. Well, that's nothing compared to the order of a cell and, and, and the ability for it to have like a commander and one to be doing construction and one taking away waste, I mean, within just the one cell of a body, it's like a little city. And um, so we realize that, that we have this beautiful order, okay, in the body and, and, in, and in creation. And, and so it, again, it points to the fact there has to be an intelligence behind this. And so we have, again, coming to the conclusion of God. And then another one is beauty. And, um, you know, think about, because it's going to, um, well, around here we can go to Niagara Falls, okay? <laughs> so uh, that's one of our treats here in New York. And, um, and, it, and it's beautiful, okay? Just to be able to, to see the power of water and um, as, you know, just cascading, okay? Um, over a cliff and um, just, you know, just the, the magnitude of it. And where we look at a sunset, I mean, sunsets are just, Oh my goodness, so gorgeous and, and so life-giving and, um, and just so full of color and, and, and beauty and, and just a blend of all kinds of um, clouds with, along with the light, lighting and, and sometimes with the scenery of trees in, in, in there. Um, and so we see beauty or we go to an ocean or we just look at a child, okay? Or we look at um, just, just um, even the beauty of seeing a loving act. And it, and it warms us to tears, okay? All of those are, are signs of beauty. Okay, where does that come from? You know what I mean? And again, it, it points to a creator that could create beauty, not just straight lines, black and white, okay? Um, and, and so you have this whole blend. And so all of these, okay, point to a creator. They point to a God. We might not know who he is. And that's why when you look at anthropo anthropology, okay, although I've never studied it, okay, but I'm going by the word of others, <laughs> okay, um, they say that every beginning tribe had a belief in God because they realized none of this could just come of its own itself. So that's one of the ways in which we can come to the knowledge of God. And they did that really, really fast, okay? So I didn't want to just skip by that. Okay, they have a little quote underneath it here. As St. Paul says of the Gentiles, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity has been clearly perceived in the things that they have, that have been made. Okay, and that is a um, beautiful quote of St. Paul. Um, when if you read about him in, in Romans, he, he mentions it, and he refers to wisdom. And, and in wisdom, <laughs> it's a little bit harsh, but it's like, or it was the wisdom of character he refers to. And he's like, you know what? Um, you, you are responsible if you don't come to a belief in God, because common sense tells you to get there. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really, um, you know, um, make it... Um, soft it just sort of puts it right out there like you, you know you have to start using your brain and, and you know it's really a denial of common sense to come to the belief that there's no god um another quote says as saint augustine issues this challenge question the beauty of earth question the beauty of the sea question the beauty of the air descending and diffusing itself question the beauty of the sky question all these realities all respond See, we are beautiful. 
Their beauty is a profession, a confession. These beauties are subject to change. Who made them if not the beautiful one? Who is not subject to change? Isn't that beautiful? It's so poetic, okay? Um, I say the custom really is. Um, he's just a, an amazing author um, because I mean, that was part of his uh, journey. You know, he, he loved words and so he, um, what do they call them? rhetoric, 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 he used to teach rhetoric, okay, how to say things in a way that was very attractive, by the way, which you put words together, and uh, he truly knows how to do that. Okay, the human person. <clears throat> this, actually, um, if I remember correctly, was actually proposed by Pope John Paul II as a proof for God, um, so it wasn't in the classical one of St. Thomas Aquinas. He's usually the one we have for a proof of God, but um, John Paul II said, let's just look at the human person. For him, that was a proof of the existence of God. And he writes, with his openness to truth and beauty, his sense of moral goodness, his freedom and the voice of his conscience, with his longing for the infinite and for happiness, man questions himself about God's existence. In all this, he discerned signs of his spiritual soul. The soul, the seed of eternity, we bear in ourselves, irreducible to the merely material, can have its origin only in God. Okay, and it's sort of like we were talking about in the very beginning of this session. Um, you know, we have this sense, okay, of a longing for the infinite, for happiness. Um, and, and, and so there has to be something that causes that, something that will fulfill that. And, and so, John Paul II says, you know, this whole uh, questing shows that there's a God, okay? Because the soul, you know, everything else has an answer. You know, when you have hunger, you've got food. You know, um, when you're cold, you've got clothing. We, we've got answers to different things, but there's this other longing. You know what I mean? And so what is it, okay? But pointing again to the existence of God, something that only could be filled by something infinite. Paragraph 34 says, the world and man attest that they contain within themselves neither their first principle nor their final end, but rather that they participate in being itself. Just so you know, a final first principle means um, the cause of something, and a final end would be the reason for something, okay? So again, it says the world and man attest that they contain within themselves neither their first principle nor their final end but rather that they participate in being itself, which alone is without origin or end. Thus, in different ways, man can come to know that there exists a reality, which is the first cause, the final end of all things, and a reality that everyone calls God. Paragraph 35, man's faculty makes him capable of coming to a knowledge of the existence of a personal God. But for man to be able to enter into real intimacy with him, God willed both to reveal himself to man and to give him the grace of being able to welcome this revelation in faith. The proof of God's existence, however, can predispose one to faith and help one to see that faith is not opposed to reason. Okay, um, so again, we, we come to an understanding that God exists. So, but God is not going to just leave us there. And he, I mean, and then again, I mean, we feel sorry for those who did not get to know. I mean, like, that's why we could be so grateful to God that he's allowed us to know who he is, not just that he is, okay? That would be the reason. I think we actually get to know who he is by him revealing himself to us, okay? Um, from the time of, um, I, you know, Adam and Eve, okay? Um, and, and then again, revealing himself to different people, different centuries throughout the existence of man. The knowledge of God according to the church. And then we are now on paragraph 36. O Holy Mother of the Church, hold, I'm sorry, our Holy Mother of the Church, holds and teaches that God, the first principle and the last end of all things, can be known with certainty from the created world by the natural light of human reason. Without this capacity, men would not be able to welcome God's revelation. Man with this capacity, because he is created in the image of God. In the historical condition in which he finds himself, however, man experiences many difficulties in coming to know God 
by the light of reason alone. And this is going to be a quote. Uh, Though human reason is, strictly speaking, truly capable by its own nature, natural power and light, of attaining to a true and certain knowledge of the one personal God, who watches over and controls the world by his providence, and of the natural law written in our hearts by the Creator, yet there are many obstacles which prevent reason from the effective and fruitful use of this inborn faculty. For the truths that concern the relation between God and man wholly transcend the visible order of things. And if they are translated into human action and influence it, they call for a self-surrender and an abnegation. The human mind in its turn is hampered in the attaining of such truths, not only by the impact of the senses and the imagination, but also by the disordered appetites, which are the consequences of original sin. So it happens that men in such matters easily persuade themselves that what they would not like to be true is false, or at least doubtful. Okay, and I would say, um, that's a hard paragraph to follow, but I, I, what I would understand from this one, that they want to really have us understand is that we can get, um, when we have a, a, a culture around us that's not pointing to God, okay, whether that's our own particular family or our society, like today, okay, we have um, so much such an impact in our families from TV, okay, and from the computer, from music, and it's void of God for the most part. But what it goes after, what it shows, okay, from very early time, because so many parents have allowed their children to be babysat, okay, really, by, um, and not, like, by, and I'm not blaming, I'm not putting any blame, okay, I, I realize there's lots of different circumstances, but, um, but we know it's a bad choice quite often, okay. Uh, but you know, but they, they're, they're influenced by seeing constant um, activity, okay? So whether they're playing a game on the computer or whether they're watching a television program or whether they're um, you know, doing um, different, um, I don't know, different games or whatever that might be, they're, they, they're, they're inundated, okay, with sense experience. And then with false principles of what will bring you happiness, okay? Again, money is often put out there. Pleasure, okay? Objectifying other people. Um, positions, uh, you know, and, and just things, okay? You know, whoever has the most cars wins, um, you know? And, and so you have this emptiness, okay? And, and, and a person, you know, if they're brought up with that, okay? It's what they go questing after. And like I said, like, so sadly, there's so many people who are disappointed in this world and, and fall into despair because that's what they've been taught. You know I mean? and so their mind doesn't even go past these things to even be sensitive to that longing of God and, and, and coming to use your reason to know that God exists. St. Augustine said that was one of his big problems. You know, He said that, you know, God, you created everything so beautiful that I went after all the things which goes to point me to God, but I got stuck on the things, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so I didn't come to the reality of where do those things come from, you know? And, uh, and so we often have that happen in our world today. So that's really what that paragraph was about. Like I said, it was a little bit, um, you know, maybe like one of those ones you have to read about three times, four times before you really know what it was saying. Um, this is why man stands in need of being enlightened by God's revelation not only about those things that exceed his understanding, but also about those religious and moral truths, which of themselves are not beyond the grasp of human reason. So that even in the present condition of the human race, they can be known by all men with ease, with firm certainty, and with no admixture of error. Okay. And so like you just see God's revelation of being such an act of mercy, of him letting us know that he exists. And letting him know, letting us know how loving and concerned he is about the individual person. I remember one time um, I was having what's called an enthronement of the sacred heart in someone's home, which is something really beautiful. And I hope to be able to bring to many people um, where we're ministering to right now in North Tonawanda. And so we were we were bringing an image. Okay, in this case we had a we had a I think we had a picture at that point. I think they may have gotten a statue later. 
but we were creating that, that picture in a prominent place in their home where they stayed and they had visitors come in. And we were placing it, okay, there to remind them that he was the Lord of the home. He was the one when they made a decision, it was his standard that they were going to consider first. You know, before they put the TV on, would Christ be comfortable watching this with them? Um, you know, when they were having um, any kind of family, you know, gatherings, okay, was that conversation something that God could stay at that conversation? So having that image there and, and that willingness also to witness to anyone who came to their home that, you know what, he's, he's um, part of the family, you know, um, you know, he's not just someone that we go to the church, you know, on Sunday, but he's, he's a part of our everyday life. And um, I remember this one man said, it was really hard for him to believe that, you know, like God really knew him. You know, he was willing to go along with it. You know, he wanted to honor God. <laughs> and he's like, I don't think God really knows. You know, there's millions of people here on earth. How can he know me and, and my concerns? There's no, no way. Okay. And he had put this human limitlessness on God. And, and, and God was so true. I mean, him allowing the enthronement, him wanting to honor God, God was willing to reveal himself. And there were just certain things that kept on happening following that. And it was no way that they could happen without them coming from God. And they were just small things. You know, there's small little details that God answers, you know? Um, and you're thinking, well, that, that's what the God knows, you know? <laughs> and uh, you know, so, you know, I, I think about... Um, for me, I remember one of those God moments is when I was transferred one time back to a house. Um, I had been, at one time I was being transferred to another one. And it was, um, it was for me, it was just a, a hard moment in my life. And um, one of the things that since I, my childhood that always depicted God to me was the moon, okay? Especially when the rays would come down, okay? Um, in his bedroom. Because when I was in seventh grade, uh, the sister had read to us, a, a letter from Jesus, and he was talking about how he was trying to reveal himself, and that you know, even the moonbeams, they had to touch your face, and then yet still you didn't acknowledge him, but he would wait. Okay, and it always just hurt me to know that so many times, like, God is doing all these little things, and we ignore them. So that was always like a little sign between me and God. Okay, anyway, that night when I had arrived um, to this comment, it was, it was a rainy night, okay, and it really never dawned on me until the next day, but when I got to bed, the moon beams were shining right on me. And it was just those little things, okay? Like, you know, I was moving for the love of God. And it was his little intimate way of being able to say, you know what? I'm here. And I, I love you. Even coming here to Tawanda, okay? I, I just arrived almost three weeks ago now. And, um, you know, um, sometimes change is a little bit hard, you know? Uh, a little scary. You don't know anybody. You don't know what you're exactly how your uh, ministry is going to go. And um, I went to the room that they had assigned me. Um, and here, hanging on a nail, was a rosary that I have always been looking for because I had lost mine. And it was a wooden one. And it, um, it, was, uh, it had a wooden Benedictine cross, crucifix in the very beginning of it. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, that was hanging right there in my room. And, and the priest, that he actually kind of put it there even himself. But even if he did, he wouldn't know that about me. So it was just something, it was just like a beautiful little touch from God saying, yep, I have you here for a reason. And uh, so we could take those things. And that's what we mean by this revelation. He reveals himself, okay? So especially, we, you know, we can look at Abraham. Or we can go to Moses. Um, and then we go to the New Testament and coming in, this, in flesh. And Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So you see this beautiful willingness, okay, and desire to be able to help us know him and to be able to get to know him. Um, so this is the beauty, okay, of the revelation that we have in Scripture. So that we can't come by it because things get blocked in our natural way of getting to know him. But he was willing to go ahead and, and reveal himself so that we would not be um, left groping in this world that would have a sure way of knowing that we are loved and that we're cared for and that our, our life has a purpose. Um, I'm tempted to read a little bit more um, and I think we could do it. <laughs> these, 
So this paragraph is nice and short, okay? And we like finish chapter one if I get this little part done. Um, so this is, um, okay, I'm gonna do paragraphs 39 to 49, okay? And um, because they're, they're very short, succinct, and they're getting close to being a summary of what we've covered in this first little section. But it says, how can we speak about God? In defending the ability of human reason to know God, the church is expressing her confidence in the possibility of speaking about him to all men and with all men, and therefore of dialogue with other religions, with philosophy and science, as well as with unbelievers and atheists. Since our knowledge of God is limited, our language about him is equally so. We can name God only by taking creatures as our starting point and in accordance with our limited human ways of knowing and thinking. Because God's infinite, you know, in all eternity, we're always going to be getting to know God. Um, there's always, that's what's going to be so fascinating. You know, part of a relationship is getting to know someone. And, you know, uh, when you start sharing secrets or you get a story about them from the past, and, you know, and it just adds light to that relationship. And, and with God, there's always going to be that. In heaven, we're always learning more because God's infinite. Even the angels are still learning about God, you know. Um, so because we're finite. Um, and yet God made us for the infinite, so we get to live forever, okay? And then we'll always, so life will always be interesting, okay? Uh, we won't be bored. <laughs> okay, all creatures bear a certain resemblance to God, most especially man, created in the image and likeness of God. The manifold perfections of creatures, their truth, their goodness, their beauty, all reflect the infinite perfection of God. Consequently, we name God by taking his creature's perfections as our starting point. For from the greatness and beauty of created things come the corresponding perception, perception of their creator. So you think about someone that you know who's just thoughtful, okay? It just gives you a little glimmer of the thoughtfulness of God. And sometimes it opens you more, okay, to seeing God's thoughtfulness, okay, in the way in which he was willing to give us different seasons, okay? or different kinds of plants, or different kinds of personalities, um, you know, all different kinds of phenomena, I mean, or different flowers, you know what I mean? Why, why would he give us flowers? Just to beautify our, our lives? I mean, it, it's so amazing just to think about uh, that. But we can sometimes learn that by looking at creatures themselves, okay? Of who God is, okay? Um, and his, um, his qualities. God transcends all creatures. We must therefore continually purify our language of everything in it that is limited, image bound, or imperfect. If we are not to confuse our image of God, the inexpressible, the incomprehensible, the invisible, the ungraspable, with our human representations, our human words always fall short of the mystery of God. Um, and, and you think about that, you know, when we have this, the word love, People have never ever stopped getting bored, okay, with writing poetry, songs, or telling stories that convey love because it's very hard to define love, okay? And so, you know, that's just one quality of, of God, okay? He allows us to experience as human beings, but we know it's so hard to actually put a definition there, okay? It's within our grasp and yet out of our grasp. Um, it's like holding water, you can't hold it, you experience it. Um, admittedly, in speaking about God like this, our language is using human modes of expression. Nevertheless, it really does attain to God himself, though unable to express him in his infinite simplicity. Likewise, we must recall that between creator and creature, no similitude can be expressed without implying an even greater dissimilitude, <laughs> and that concerning God, we cannot grasp what he is but only that he is and what he is not, and how other beings stand in relation to him, okay? So even as we talk about how similar we are, we realize there's, great, there's even greater non-similarity because his is so much greater, okay, than anything that we have. Ours is so limited. Um, just, you know, again, we look at love and his being so unconditional. Absolutely no reason for our existence except the goodness of God and wanting to share the happiness of heaven with us. Um, and then when we blow it, will he become down and become a man and die and suffer so that we can get to heaven and still allowing us to forsake him or to say no to him and willing to forgive?
forgive us again and again. It, it, it just goes beyond human reasoning um, and our experience. So it, it's a beautiful reality. I think that I'm going to have to leave my last part, the in brief, until the next time I see you, which will be next week on Tuesday. Um, I thank you for joining us. And I'm just going to close with a prayer. Today is the Feast of the Stigmata of St. Francis of Assisi. It's also the Feast of St. Robert Bellarmine. And uh, what's so beautiful is St. Robert Bellarmine was a Jesuit. Okay? And uh, again, he had a great, great love for St. Francis. And the Holy Father went to St. Robert Bellarmine, and he was noticing that the love of people was a little bit weak throughout the world. And he said, Robert, uh, I don't know if he was a bishop or cardinal at that time. He said, what can we do? And he said, let's have a feast celebrating the moment when St. Francis received the stigmata. In other words, St. Francis, who loved God so much and modeled his life on Christ, um, wanted to be as much as he could like to Christ. And um, he just asked God to let him experience that love and all the suffering as much as he was able to because of his intense desire to be as much like to Christ because we were made in the image and likeness. And, uh, and God allowed him the great mystery, it was the first one we ever knew of in, in uh, the history of the church, to actually receive the wound marks in his hands, in his feet, and his side. And so today, that's the feast that they brought Robert Bellarmine uh, put in place. So today is actually the feast of the Stigmata, but it's also the feast of St. Robert Bellarmine. And so let's just pray um, the prayer of St. Francis as a closing prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, where there's hatred, let me sow love, where there's injury, pardon, where there's doubt, faith, where there's despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I may never seek so much to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, to be pardoned as to pardon, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I missed a few lines in there, but... <laughs> We are St. Francis and St. Robert Bellarmine, but please pray for us and help us to correspond with love to all God's love. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.